Is it is it on? Okay. Uh, we're going to talk about visual design today. And again, this is typically what, what people typically think about when they think of web design. Um, we start off talking about things more abstract, such as goals and requirements. And that doesn't diminish the fact that, that, the, that the visual design of a page is very important. All right? It's just saying that, you know, we want to make sure we have a, a clear idea of what we want to do before we, 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 we worry about those aspects of it. So I'm not saying that that's not important. I'm just saying that it, uh, um, it, it, it needs to follow sort of a sequence of, of making sure you're doing the right thing first before you worry about doing it the right way. You know, I guess defining the goals and all that is making sure you're doing the right thing. The visual design is sort of like making sure you're doing it the right way. Doesn't do you any good to do the wrong thing the right way or the right thing the wrong way. So you want to nail both of these. And when I use the phrase visual language, I've heard people use it before. Not a lot dealing with web design, but what do you suppose I mean by visual language? What does a phrase visual language mean? Well, we probably understand both those words individually, but let's think about them together. You know, when we talk about something visual, obviously we mean looking at it. All right, in other words, through the eyes. And when we talk about language, we're talking about a way to express ideas. And, you know, there's, there's obviously languages like, you know, English and written languages, verbal languages. There are oral languages that are spoken. Um, there is uh, mathematical language. There's scientific language. Visual language is a way of communicating stuff through simply the visual elements of the page irrespective of the words on the page. Now, at first glance, you might think and say, well, visual language, um, you can't communicate a lot by that. Well, there's some examples of stuff that we use visual language for all the day, all the time. If we see, if we're driving, and like me, we don't have the best eyesight, but we see a sign that looks something like this, that is red, we know a stop sign's coming up. You know, if we see on bug spray, this is a horrible drawing, but if we see a skull and crossbones on bug spray, actually I kind of like that. If you see a skull and crossbones on bug spray, you know that that's poison. These are ways of communicating things without using words. All right? It's just through visual signs. It can be done through color. It can be done through spacing. It can be done through font. These are all our tools, or our elements of visual language. And I think a good way to consider what you can communicate with visual language is to look at a page where we don't understand the words. All right? And see what conclusions we can come to. And specifically, we'll look at two different pages that we don't know what the words mean. Now again, I had to try to decide what the best language to use is because, you know, if I pick Spanish, a lot of people pick Spanish, or a lot of people do speak Spanish or French or something like that. So I'm hoping that we don't have anyone that speaks Icelandic in here, all right? There is approximately 300,000 people that live in Iceland, um, which is about the, the population of Lorain County. All right, so it's a small country, so I'm thinking, I'm thinking it's a pretty safe bet. And if you do, pretend that you don't for, for a minute here. I have two pages, and we're going to bring them up, we're going to talk about them. And we're going to talk about 
what conclusions we can make about the page and what in the visual language does it. Because obviously we're not going to understand any of the words. All right, so here is one of the pages. Okay, that is, that is a breakfast cereal. Uh, there's a slideshow. Let's just watch it for... You know the show and it's called Lazy Town. All right. Okay. This is, this, is, uh, this is a kid's TV show. Which if you think about it, in seeing the pictures, it makes sense. What do you use kids' TV shows for? To sell cereal. All right. The guy that was running did look athletic, but if you notice, he didn't really look like athletes you would typically see. I mean, he had a long, pointy mustache and was wearing kind of an unusual outfit and so on. And there's a bunch of kids running, and then we're back to the cereal and so on. And if we scroll down, it might be even more apparent. There's the stars of the show. Sporticus. Yes. Yeah, uh, our little mouse over tells us indeed that is Sporticus. This guy, this guy is Robbie Rotten, which I would assume is a villain. And again, notice that, interestingly enough, they have those in English because Glani Glaper apparently is this. Then we have these, some of these other folks. And then we have this. All right. But the idea is, is that without really too much about this, we, 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 we kind of came to the conclusion, and we were moving towards the conclusion. We did have a spoiler in class, but other than that, <laughs> other than that, we came to the conclusion that this is something for kids. How did we come, how did we come that, to that conclusion? Yes. Bright colors, very cartoony. Looking. Bright colors. The pictures are very uh, um, stylized, very over-the-top, cartoony-looking is a good way to describe it. If we scroll down and look, you know, the, the pink hair, the obvious. You know, you look at this, you know that this isn't a serious drama. All right? You know, just that guy. He certainly looks like a villain, but he doesn't look like a villain that really is all that terrifying. All right? And then, of course, down there you have puppets. So, bright colors, vivid images, all those things point to the fact that this is probably for kids. All right? Let's look at this. And if you, and if you tell me that you're you know, that your mom is an immigrant from Iceland and this is where she gets her local news, I'm, I'm going to kick you out of class. <laughs> what does this look like? And, and I think I spoiled the... This looks like a news report. This looks like a news site. What about it makes it look like a news site? How do you know that instantly? Okay, there, I, I don't see that immediately, but... I'll, I'll take your word for it. I just, I'm just, oh, news in English, yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah, that's a tip off. Even if you didn't see that, what would do, what, 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 would, what would convince you of it? The layout of it. The layout of it. All right. Um, there is something that, even if we don't speak the language, we can kind of recognize that as a date because of format. Yes. Picture with a paragraph alongside of it. All right. Um, this navigation is kind of uh, very typical in news articles. What do you think this is? An ad. An ad. Why do you think that that's an ad? Because it looks a lot different than the stuff around it. Likewise, what about that? Probably an ad. Why are these things in this section and these things in this section? 
yeah. I don't we don't know exactly what they are, but they're they're related. All right? So in other words, they're grouped, they're close to each other. All right? So therefore, the fact that they're physically close to each other means something. You know, you're not going to have a newspaper where you have a sports article here, the weather, and then another sports article down there. Right? It just, it's not logical. All right? Um, let's see some of these other things. What would you say is the most important article in this page? The big one. All right? So, let's think about these. Let's think about some of these things and come to some conclusions based on visual design and, um, or, or visual language and what we can communicate. Number one, visual, uh, we can specify the tone of the page. In other words, it's obvious to tell that this is a news page, or put differently, this is a more serious page, and this is a page meant for kids. You could tell that at a glance. And how can we tell that? How can we tell the mood of the page? The colors used, the fonts used, all right? These fonts are for lack of a better word, less formal looking, all right, more, more casual. Yes? There's a lot more like greens and blues and yellows as opposed to black and white. Right, exactly. Much more colorful for uh, a kids. The amount of variety in the color, all right. This page, if you look, the fonts are very, you know, font 101s, right? I mean, you have serif fonts for the headlines, sans serif fonts for the text. Does everybody know the difference between serif and sans serif fonts? All right? Serif is, and I've heard a couple stories about this, so I don't know. Uh, maybe I'll make one up or, or not, but if you look at a letter, if this was the letter A in a certain font, these little thingies are called serifs. So like the little stripe that's at the end of the letter is called a serif. Or like in the letter L, you might have looking like that. These little extra things are called serifs. Sans serif, sans is simply French for without. So a sans serif letter would look like that. So that would be sans serif. This would be a serif font. So if I talk about this page, I say that the headlines are in Serif font, notice that, let me make it bigger. Notice that the K here has the little thingies on top, little serifs. Whereas, the K in this, in the article, does not. That's a typical recipe, all right, on websites. Using serif fonts for headlines and using sans serif fonts for text. And the reasoning for that is those serifs actually help people visually identify and read the letters. It's useful in, in reading. It, it makes the re reading more clear, all right. Um, However, in small resolution, sans serif fonts are a little more readable. So that's why headlines are typically in that, in serif fonts. Um, sans serif fonts are used for articles. 
if we can look at the Wall Street Journal, same recipe. Serif font for headlines, sans serif font for the topics of the article. These I would describe as following sort of a third category of font, which is more like, I guess you'd call it decorative fonts, where it's not really, they, they, they're almost like hand-drawn, not maybe exactly hand-drawn, but there's some irregularity in them. They're, they're not quite as, as consistent and machine-like. Again, and that evokes a certain feel. So, the colors of the page, the fonts of the page, Anything else that gives us a hint that this might be a site for kids and this might be a site, a more serious news site? The pictures, and, and how so the pictures? Okay. Okay, so the look of the pictures. Anything else about the pictures? If you're going to compare the amount of real estate taken up by text versus pictures on this page, I would guess that a higher percentage, there's a lot more pictures, you know, space-wise than there would be text on this page Whereas this one is a lot more even. So, more pictures versus less pictures. Yes? I can't tell both of them being in foreign languages, but if I had to bet, I'd say they're using simpler language than the other one as well. That, that's, 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 another, that's another way to, 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 to say it too, the, the fact that simpler language is saying it. I would say, though, that really my, our focus today is on the visual aspect of that. So you could probably guess that just by looking at the, the words are shorter, like, I got to say, even if you're a native Icelandic speaker, this is probably a hard word. <laughs> Whereas the words here, I don't know, there's some pretty long ones in there too. All right. Yeah. Yeah, it's just a long language, right. So. First thing that we've seen is the tone of the page, all right? And a real good rule of thumb is the tone of the page should match the content. That is, a serious page should look serious, a fun page should look fun. Now, you might look and say, well, duh, of course. But again, remember, you know, as, as I've said before, you know, common sense isn't necessarily always common. And there's people that mess up. There's people that think, hey, I know I'm doing a site for a bank, but I want to make our site fun for people to go to. People don't go to a bank site for fun. People go to the bank site to conduct business, and that's what they want to do. If anything, if it looks fun, it could damage the credibility of the bank, you know. So, first thing we can do, first thing that we can do just immediately, right off the bat, and this takes fractions of seconds for people to realize, is we can set the tone of the page. We can give our users an idea, sort of the tone of the page, by the choice of colors, the choice of fonts, and sort of the amount of and the, the, the style of the pictures. We were able to determine with a high degree of certainty that this is an ad. And we said that by saying that, well, it looks different than everything else on the page. All right. 
That's another rule of thumb that I would say is a good basic design principle. Now remember, we talked before about the I Love Bees website. You know, these are guidelines. These are not cut and dried, hard and fast rules. That your job is to create something that's appropriate for your specific project. But we can tell that's an ad. I would guess this is an ad. I would guess this is an ad. I would guess this is an ad. This is an ad. This is an ad. How do I know? But I know, for example, that this probably isn't an ad. All right. How can I tell that? We said that they look different. And that's one fundamental rule. Similar things should look similar. Different things should look different. We can tell at a glance that this, 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 these are all news articles. How do we know they're all news articles? Because they all look the same. They all have the same basic format. They have a serif font in blue. Might be hard to see, but that's, a, that's like a, I don't know how you describe it, but that's a, a shade of blue for the headline. And then it has sans serif text underneath it. And it has a little link, which I assume probably means more, to click on to get the full article. So it appears that every single article on, the, on this page fits that format. So without us being able to read a word of this, we could look and say, Article, 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 article. This, that's not an article. That's something else. We even know that that's not really a picture associated with an article because they, they designate those sort of in a different manner. Typically, like the small ones, they put the picture alongside of it, whereas this doesn't really have any text alongside of it. So by being consistent and by presenting similar things in a similar manner, you're actually teaching your users how your site is structured. All right? If one of these articles look different, would assume that there's something different about it. All right? If one of these looked very different than the rest, we would assume that there was something different about it. Or the importance is more. Or the importance is more. Exactly. Like with, like, with the big picture. like with the big picture. And that's another one. Importance. What helps us decide the importance of things? The size is one. What's another? What's another thing that tells us that something's important? Okay. It's position. All right. In newspapers, they talk about something, an article being above the fold. All right. If you imagine this being a newspaper, you know, if you went on a newsstand, Above the fold would be the stuff that you would see here. If I'm just shopping and I'm looking, should I buy a copy of The Plain Dealer today? I'm going to look up and the important thing is going to be staring me in the face. The less important stuff, maybe I'll flip it around and look at that. All right, But I'm definitely going to look at this side. So the higher on the page and the more prominent position it has, the more important it has, the more importance that we impart to it. All right? It is, and, and of course, the size of it. In this case, the picture is bigger, the font is bigger, 
And there is even probably a few more words in this little blurb than uh, the rest of them. All right. Um, it's funny, you know, if you, if you, you know, with little kids, you know, little kids will draw things in proportion to how important they perceive them. You know, if you ever notice, like, you ask a little kid to draw a picture of their family, you know, even though, you know, I'm six foot three and my daughters when they were, th you know, three or four years old were somewhat shorter than six foot three, when they drew them, they would be like my size. All right. Why? Because they, you know they're the center of their universe. Of course they are. They're supposed to be. All right. So that's something that's like ingrained into our mind. That something that's bigger takes prominence. Is more important. And culturally, we sort of learn that the position also matters as well. So that's another thing that we have. All right. We looked at different sections, and we can't read the words to know for sure what these sections are. But the positioning also comes into play when we're talking about grouping like things together. All right? So, things that are next to each other are probably more related to things uh, than things that are far apart. So, this article probably has more in common with this article than it has with this article. I don't know what, but it probably does. How can we designate that? How can we designate different sections of our page? How can we group things? Yes. I have a theme or a category. Like right there, I could kind of tell maybe it was a fourth section. Okay. And then how can we visually show that? Borders. Borders. Anything else? Yeah. Like a heading. A header. All right. A header that, again, and if, it, if they're equal sections of the paper, logically, the heading should be the same size. So this is our weather, this is our sports. Those are each considered equally weighted categories. All right. Anything else we could do? Pardon me? Yeah, in the, in the HTML code we can do that. All right. Another thing we can do is, let me see if they'd have an example of this anywhere. Not really, but they're, they're, doing, they're doing this for maybe a slightly different reason. These notice are set apart a little bit by virtue of the fact that they have a different uh, color background. Now, a few things to notice about this. And by no means do I hold this up as an example of a perfectly designed web sign. I mean, there's a lot of content on this page. This is a pretty busy page. And, and I'm not crazy about that aspect of it. Of course, they've done a very good job of giving you and allowing you to skim where you can look and see if this is something that interests you and if it does you can go to the more section. All right, that's that's very good. Right. And uh, the the technical word for that by putting padding and margins is white space. So you can put white space around things so that they're not so compressed together. You folks, I, I graded um, the good and bad web design examples, and some of those bad examples were just really bad. I mean, there, there is so much fun looking at bad web pages, all right? Um, and I'd encourage you, if you found a particularly bad one, to post it to the forum. But a lot of them are simply like a bunch of stuff just crammed in a page. Whereas here, through the use of borders, through the use of... Um, 
different colors in some cases, through the use of white space. We separate sections from each other. So in other words, we look here, there's a heading here, different section, different section, different section, and so on. A little bit of white space here indicates that this column is different than this column. Now, the thing to, go, go ahead. What are those things near the top of the page on the left that you can't see? What things on the top of the page to the left? To the left of that. that is, I believe, part of a background image. I believe it's part. Actually, on a wider monitor, it's more prominent. In other words, because of the size of my monitor, I am cutting out a good section of it. If I had a bigger monitor, let me briefly try to, try to change the resolution here and hope that it works. It works, I, I, I'm seeing it like this, but I'll keep the changes and we'll go back and look at it. All right, we'll have to turn it. Wrong way. Oh, we can't see it. There we go. Notice now you can see that there, but they did not design, they did not do a good job designing this for multiple screen resolutions because when I come in with my screen resolution, that gets cut off, all right? So they're counting on people having giant monitors. It should be interesting if I were to view this on my mobile device, how this was handled. Would I be able to see anything? But that, yeah, it's a, it's a great question. It's a great question. And that's what makes web development so difficult, is you really don't have any knowledge or control over how people are viewing your pages. There's a million browsers out there. there for each of those million browsers, there's a million uh, versions. And for each platform that they're running on, there's millions of tiny little variations such as monitor size and all that, that that can affect it. And your job is to make it work in all of those. Well, that's really the power of the web, right? That everyone can see it. That it's not the Apple wide web or the Microsoft wide web or anything like that. It's the world wide web. All right. The downside is you have to accommodate all these different things. Notice a couple things about this, all right? We talked about all the ways that we can do these things, and they included things such as white space, space between things, different colors, both in terms of font and background. We talked about uh, different fonts that can be used. We talked about light things being alike, different things being different, and so on. But when you notice this, the actual content itself only has a handful of these elements in there. In other words, there aren't 10 colors on this page. And I'm, I'm not talking about the ads here, I'm talking about the content. There is, for the most part, blue, gray, black, and white. There's a splash of green there, a splash of red there, and so on. Why do you think that is? 
why only such a, a, a small number of colors? And we can make the same observation for fonts too, by the way. Unity, consistency, exactly. We want a consistent look on our pages. If we use too many different fonts or too many different colors, what would we lose as far as our visual language goes? would lose the ability to connect things together in our mind. For example, when we first look at this, I made the observation that every article has a headline in a certain font, has text in a certain font. This is blue, this is black, and it's like that for virtually all the articles on the page. If we started playing around with that and one of these guys had a green headline and one of these guys had a red headline and this was in a different font and all that, your mind is going to start associating some kind of meaning with that. Like, why is that green? What is special about that article? And it'll be confusing. So you'll lose the consistency. Yes? Is part of this learned? And what I'm getting at is we've been using newspapers for a few hundred years or maybe a hundred plus years so most people around the world have been exposed to this we're used to this visual structure yes we can very quickly understand it and it has many decades of research as to what's the most effective way to present mm -hmm. but couldn't there be other content that's not as effective to present in this format okay um, that is a great question the, the question was was that for things such as newspapers, there's been newspapers around forever. And over time, a certain structure for newspapers evolved. And the web, by and large, has is, is just sort of imitated that. All right? So the question is, is, could there be other ways to present stuff that is just or more effective in different situations? And the answer is probably. All right? Some of these things, I would argue, are just sort of ingrained, like the notion that bigger things carry more weight and more importance. You know, that I don't know is something that is learned per se. All right? And like white space between things indicating separation and different things looking different. And same things looking the same. Those are things I think that are pretty fundamental. If I have, for example, three pieces of fruit up here and two of them were red with shiny skins and one was orange with a bumpy skin, you're going to know that those two are probably going to taste the same. That third one's going to taste different. All right? And you have a similar sort of thing. Do keep in mind what I was saying before. That whenever we talk about web design rules, we're talking less about rules than we're talking about guidelines. And we're talking about guidelines that apply for most basic, typical sorts of websites. So, could another sort of layout be appropriate and another sort of rules? For a different kind of problem, yes. Absolutely. Alright? But, if you're doing a standard website for a business, there's value in playing it safe and sticking with sort of the standard rules. I, I, you know, a great example of this, a great simple example of this would be a business card. All right, we all know what business cards look like. Maybe I, I do not have one on me because I lost my wallet like 30 times over the past two months and I think I lost a lot of my business cards. But typical business card looks the same. It's going to be something like this. It's going to be maybe the logo of the company. There's going to be the name. There's going to be um, maybe my title. 
contact info, email, and maybe some other stuff. All right. So, if you had to make a bit, you know, and this is probably true, you know, the president of our college has a business card that looks like this, I'm sure. And I'm sure if you went to, um, you know, local school system, the superintendent of schools probably has a business card that looks like this. And the sales rep for McGraw-Hill that comes in has a business card that looks like this. People involved in sort of standard businesses are all going to have business cards that resemble this. If you were working in a field that was much different. If you were a like a creative working in uh, photography, all right, your business card might look a little different than that. It might have a picture on the on the background and some text. If you were a record producer, if you were a graphic designer, if you were um, something that was l a less standard, more creative sort of career, then your business card is liable to reflect that. And I would argue that a website would be like this. You know, when we talk about these guidelines, you know, there, there's the whole, you know, there's a whole 80-20 rule, you know. 80% of things are going to fall into a certain category, then there's going to be the outliers that are a little bit different. I want to be clear that when I talk about these things, I expressly talk about them as being guidelines because the specific problem you're working on does matter. The idea here is as far as like deviating from sort of your standard run of the mill layout for this, you need to know when to pick your spots. You need to know when it's a good idea to do that when the problem calls for it. And not just try things just because you think it would be cool to do such and such. Gee, wouldn't it be great if um, my business card had a picture, my third grade picture on it? Yeah, it's probably not a good idea for a lot of reasons. All right. If I was a creative sort of person, an artist or something, that might be cute, clever whatever you want to put it. So the idea here is these guidelines are some very general observations that we can make that are true most of the time, but the particular project that you're working on, you need to identify what applies out of these standards and what doesn't. Um, there's a good article. It, it very well might be in the resources section on ANGEL that talks about picking your spots as far as creativity goes. In other words, if you're going to do something that's non-standard, don't do a website where everything is non-standard. Pick a thing or two and show off your creativeness in that particular area. So don't, how do I want to say, don't, don't throw out the rule book. Don't break the rules, but bend the rules and bend them based on the project and, and what you think will work. That's a great, great I example, you know. And that's one thing I hope that looking at these two different examples of visual design illustrated. The last while we, we talked about the newspaper site and we kind of forgot about the kids site, but notice that these sites look very different. both in terms of the amount of content, the, the, the visual aspect of it, and so on. Could you imagine a site meant for a kid's show that looked like this? It wouldn't work. Can you imagine a serious news site that looked like this, with this guy up there? You know, this guy would be the good news, this guy. Yeah, he'd be the anchor, yeah. This guy would be the person that's giving you, I don't know, the weather during winter or, or something like that. All right. Again, it wouldn't work. So you can make the argument that both of these are reasonably well-designed sites, even though they don't look at all like each other. 
And the reason for that is, in addition to these design rules, they take into account the nature of the project. So in one respect, yeah, they both follow the rules, but they end up looking a lot different because the particular problem that you're trying to solve sort of trumps some of these things. So yes, there's more colors on this one than on the new site. All right? You absolutely have to think of the message and the audience. I mean, that's the rules of any sort of communication is first consider your message and consider your audience. Where do we get those things? We get those from the earlier phase of the design when we define our goals and when we define who our personas are, who we're trying to reach. So that ought to be what guides us. Again, if you think of my example of doing a website on jazz, depending on who I was targeting, my website might look like this, or it might look maybe more like that, or it might look more like this. If I was targeting kids in school, maybe I'd make it look like this. If I was targeting more serious musicians or whatever, maybe it would look like this. If I was targeting a general population of adults, I might bring in aspects of both designs uh, into it. All right, next time, Thursday, what we're going to do is we're going to actually start building our templates to have our wireframes and start incorporating some of these elements, different fonts, different colors we've already seen, spacing and layout. All these different visual elements that we see can actually communicate something to the user at a glance, instantaneously. We're going to see the technical aspect of that and how to do that via our HTML and CSS code. All right. Next week, by the way, is spring break. So I'm currently trying to decide between going to the French Riviera Cancun or the Oberlin Public Library. So I'll go probably to one of those three places over break and, and I'll let you know when I get back uh, which one I went to. All right, we'll see you over in lab.